Okay, so uh, what I want to do is uh, show you how to prove global regularity in 2D given everything that we've done so far. And then uh, I want to talk about continuation criteria in terms of norms in 3D and show you uh, what we know about that and how to prove it in some cases um, that are easier to explain. Okay, so um, Okay, so what's left to prove after everything that we've discussed is uh, that k in L infinity is finite. Um, so in 2D, so what we really need to prove, uh, the continuation criteria that I talked about last time, was that the integral, the time integral uh, of k along characteristics needs to remain finite. Um, for all fixed times, there should be a constant such that it's finite. That constant can definitely depend on the time. And then you have a solution uh, that can be continued uh, slightly beyond that time. Um, it turns out in 2D and also in 2.5D, you can just prove that k uh, is in L infinity. And this is a fact that you can prove if you work hard. Um, in 3D, you can't prove this. You have to actually really use the integral of k along characteristics. Um, we'll talk about that later. So um, uh, we need two estimates initially. Here, uh, so. Okay, that's uh, this is one quantity that we need to bound um, somehow. We want to show that this is uh, completely uh, bounded. Um, the other quantity. Okay, so we want to estimate these uh, two integrals, um, was, uh, and uh, here kg can be thought of as so you can take these uh, decompositions that we talked about last in the last lectures uh, for the fields 
and uh, split them up in a, a convenient way and prove point-wise estimates for the kernels and get um, a complicated expression and I'm claiming that initially what we want to do is estimate uh, completely the uh, two integrals like this um, and so, so so is it clear that that kg is better than e and b those, 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 those components they have to have a Okay, so if you remember from the first lecture, uh, these components are controlled by uh, something that I called the good conservation law. And so uh, that's what you do. You uh, basically uh, get rid of kg by using the good conservation law and you yes, can. This part is good, and now you are you try to control the rest. Yeah. Okay. So this is just the first step. Um, right. This part is good, so we can get rid of it and throw it away. And then there are other things we need to control. Um, so this this is just the first uh, estimate. Uh, um, and uh, so the main difficulty here is uh, that this term is nonlinear. It involves kg times f. And it has uh, singularities. Uh, it has uh, a two-order growth in uh, p from this uh, singularity, and then that's killed by one-order growth in p. So you have a first-order growth here, up there. You have a uh, also you have a first-order growth uh, is linear, but you also have this extra t minus s um, hanging around, um, and the main problem is that you want to uh, control this by a constant. You don't want to control it by higher order norms. So, uh, so you, to control these singularities, you uh, split. Um, so So I claim you can, can you can prove a pointwise uh, thing. Okay, so I proved the this uh, p zero squared uh, estimate uh, yesterday. Uh, you can also prove a couple of other estimates, and these are basically the three regimes that you worry about when um, you're close to the uh, the boundary of the cone. Uh, that's this one. So remember that c is uh, x minus y over t minus s. And um, this one is just the other case where you can uh, be big when you uh, when you worry about the si the uh, size of uh, that angle. Um, so you split these integrals in terms of the uh, size of either p zero squared or the size of uh, one minus. C, so you can uh, even split this in terms of the size of P0. And then you uh, use the good conservation law, so you can control these components by uh, a conservation law and throw that away. And then uh, you can control F uh, after doing, um, after the splitting by the uh, conservation laws. And uh, you can prove that these two integrals are finite. Um, by this uh, idea. Okay, and then uh, you have an estimate. Um, so this once that's done <coughs> so once, so this is, um, okay 
So being able to control these two things is one of the things that you can do in 2D that uh, is harder to do in uh, 3D and that's part of the problem. But um, once those things are bounded, then you can prove pointwise estimates for K. So K, uh, K is the fields and it's uh, expressed in terms of the uh, ST decomposition and uh, then uh, once you bound these quantities you can show that this is uh, less than or equal to box inverse uh, the absolute value of B, the integral of R2. Okay, so uh, this is what you can prove. Uh, you can you can work a little bit, and uh, um, oh, I should say one other thing. So always. Okay, so for everything I'm going to say today, box inverse f represents the solution to uh, box u equals f with zero initial data. So it's the solution to the wave equation with zero initial data. It's just an integral. Um, so you just use the integral formulas. They're uh, hiding in these expressions up there. I wrote it on the, I put it on the slides yesterday. Uh, so once these two quantities are bounded, you can work uh, a little bit and uh, get a bound like this, um, where this uh, k0 parentheses is a uh, integral of the initial data that I won't write down. It can be bounded by your assumptions on the initial data. And then uh, you get box inverse uh, absolute value of b times the integral of r2 of f over p. And then you get epsilon you can get an arbitrary epsilon to the minus one tenth times the integral p zero f dp to the two fifths, and then you can also get an epsilon to the three tenths. Uh, I've what? I'm using a function in the last term. Um, Otherwise, it's just constant. No. I'm missing a box here, that's for sure. This is not constant. Um, it depends on x and t. OK, so you can prove an estimate like that. And uh, so now, um, Uh, it's also uh, out. <laughs> um, uh, yes, it's inside. The, the two fifths is outside. Um, okay, so you can prove an estimate like this, and now you're ready to use uh, strict arts estimates. Um, and using strict arts estimates, you can get. Uh, <coughs> yes. So you are thinking of this as a function of t and x. Yes. And you are trying to bound it. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you are using those formula, right? We have already used those. So you, so you have an expression, a very complicated expression for k in terms, 
And for E and B, using the uh, ST decomposition, it's expressed in terms of integrals of uh, F. So and you are thinking of K as E and B, and to, compute, to solve them, you have to infer on something that you are bounded by these things here. Yes. Right? So how, how, I mean, and the epsilon, how does the epsilon come in here? You just uh, put it in and you can, um, how does it come in? in the, what do you mean? Do you mean how, do, how am I going to use it later or do you mean how do I get it in how the first place? It, I mean, like where, where, where does it show up? You are saying for all epsilon, like you are cut, I mean you at cut. some point you are cutting. You cut in terms of epsilon and you calculate integrals and you get that these uh, quantities are finite and what's left is an epsilon. Um, it's, it's complicated. It's a, uh, it's a over 100 pages paper, and uh, there's a, a lot of um, interpolation and a lot of uh, cutting integrals into several different small parts, and, you, and uh, there's a lot of uh, little epsilons and deltas everywhere. And then you, but uh, basically here you just uh, you cut the integrals, and you. Uh, S do splittings like this, and you calculate the uh, integ you calculate exact integrals of singularities after using Holder's inequality with uh, carefully chosen exponents, and you and you get this the you something like this times an integral, which is an epsilon. Um, okay, um, but if I explain that carefully, it would be my whole lecture. Um, so, so we want L Q T L R X control of K. Um, so use um, So now we can use uh, Strickard's estimates. Um, in fact, I uh, use the uh, improvement of the, the Strickard's due to. Uh, there's an S there. What? Can you perform a precise estimate we're going to use? Yes, that's coming. Um, but not yet. So. Um, Oh, do I? Um, okay, so I decided to uh, <laughs> give you the precise estimate in one special case in uh, 3D, not in 2D. Um, I can. Uh, give it to you also in 2D, but it's going to be ugly. Um, okay. Okay. Can you make the difference between uh, the, this one and the standard? Uh, okay. so can you explain to me why you use this one or the, the other one? Now? Okay, so there's a uh, four... What kind of estimate do you do? It's strict art. It's just... No, but everybody know, uh, or not everybody knows Strickarts. Oh, so you want me to state the arts? Uh Yeah, let me do that. Um, so, hmm. okay, yeah, let me uh, grab something else. So I uh, get this right.
Okay. So, um, okay, so basically, um, there are well known uh, family of estimates called strict arts estimates, and uh, Foschke. Uh, improve the range of exponents that you can use for the problem that we're considering that I wrote down over there. So for the uh, forcing term with zero initial data, you can get a larger range of uh, exponents. Um, yeah, this is better if I write over here. So then uh, you consider u. You can write down the solution formula. And then um, you, you can say that Okay, so this is the uh, strict arts estimate in, uh, well, it's, it's actually still quite general, but if uh, u is uh, the solution to the uh, wave equation with the force in capital F with zero initial data, then it's written in the, with this uh, solution formula, and then you can uh, prove an estimate that uh, reduces the uh, Sobolev space, uh, or I'm sorry, the LPLQ space. So you have a uh, u l q one in time l r one in space is less than or equal to f l q two prime l r two prime in uh, space, um, and then uh, and these uh, the assumptions are yes, uh, there are, is awful. Um, so. Uh, Okay, and now you see why I was trying to sweep this under the rug. Um, so this is your strict arts estimate, and these are, and you can uh, prove it in uh, any range, satisfying uh, this equality for uh, q1 r1 and q2 prime r2 prime, and these two inequalities, and q1 and q2 and r1 and r2 in this range where R2 prime and Q2 prime are the holder conjugates of uh, R2 and Q2. But these are 3D. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I copied the wrong one. Yes. Um, <laughs> sorry. So this is uh, 2, and this is uh, 2, and uh, 
this is strict and this is uh, strict um, and uh, oh I can uh, allow a one here and there's another condition <laughs> so okay so you can uh, choose a good collection of uh, exponents I uh, I couldn't think of a good way to uh, actually motivate the exponents you choose in 2d and I uh, do motivate it and when I do 3d so I just uh, left that part out okay. but uh, okay so yeah. Oh, I need to speed up. So then you can apply strict arts estimates and you obtain uh, something like uh, K is in you. You obtain a bound for K in LQ T L R X. Um, Okay, so now we want to use this bound uh, to, uh, so... So, uh, uh, yeah. so without trying to go into this, uh, yes. but just to understand what you are doing. Yes. So here you took this, this yeah. estimate, yes. and you want to apply to, each time we have this yeah. box minus one, you want to apply some estimate like that. Yes. And then, so normally you get k here, yeah. less or equal than k. I mean, like the same bound, and then yeah. you want to close it, right? This is the mo This is the next thing uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, oh, okay. So, no, you you are, so you are not assuming this. You are going to show us this, right? Or we aren't assuming anything. This is 2D, and we can prove uh, global existence for large data. Um, or once you have this estimate, then you can ha get some control on k in these spaces, and then we're going to use it, and you'll understand uh, how I'm going to use it. Momentarily. That's my question. How you get this control? K in LQLR? From here. Using those. Uh, Using strict arts estimates. Okay. okay. Um, so you, you just uh, slap an LQLR norm everywhere and uh, bound it above using the triangle inequality. And then choose the right epsilon. And, and then. Small enough yes, this, yes, this is my plan to talk about this stuff. Uh, okay. So. Bound moments. So the next thing to do is bound moments. Um, so, um, so if you multiply uh, the Vlasov equation by uh, p zero to the n, uh, then uh, you get df uh, dt plus p hat dot grad uh, xf plus k tilde dot grad pf um, equals zero uh, k tilde K tilde is the Lorentz force, so you get this equation, you integrate it, you integrate by parts, and you get um, Okay, so uh, you can uh, do this. Um, so you want to bound the moment, so you take the Vlasov equation, you multiply by p0 to the n, you integrate in x and p, and uh, you can uh, get an inequality like that after integrating by parts in x gives you 0, and in p that reduces the power of p0 to p0 to the n minus 1, 
And then the game is to uh, control this. Um, and Okay, so then a uh, holder gives you that the uh, right hand side is less than or equal to uh, P0 to the N minus 1 F L N plus 2 over uh, N plus 2 minus 1 X L1 P K in L uh, in plus two X. Okay, so by holder you can do that. Um, let me not explain it too much uh, more than that. And then uh, by you have uh, interpolation. Uh, you have the following interpolation inequality. Um, actually, let me uh, save this. Okay, so you have this uh, interpolation inequality that I may want to refer to again later. So I wrote it over here, and I won't erase it. Um, so P zero. So this is this is actually not so such a big deal, but it is something that we couldn't find anywhere. So we proved it um, by the P zero to the S G in this. Uh, m plus d over s plus d l1 uh, is bounded above by a constant that depends on the L infinity norm of g and p0 to the mg in l1 to the power s plus d over m plus d where now d is the p dimension of um, and you can do this in uh, any space or uh, p dimension and m has to be bigger than s um, so the idea here is to uh, just write the uh, p integral of p0 to the s and split into uh, a large part and a small part and then optimize in your splitting. Um, okay, so then by interpolation, uh, 
This is less than or equal to. Uh, let's go back over here. Let's call that uh, alpha tilde. I don't. Um, and then uh, you divide, and you get uh, d dt of p zero to the n f one is less than or equal to. Uh, One plus k. Um, let me just write the final thing. Okay, so, um, this, so you divide and you integrate in time uh, after using this interpolation. I didn't want to calculate this uh, alpha I, uh, on the fly, so I just called it alpha tilde. But uh, you, so you get, a, you get a constant that comes from this interpolation inequality. You divide to the other side and then you integrate and you get that the uh, nth moment of f is bounded by a constant that depends on the initial data plus uh, the L m plus 1 to the power m plus 1 norm of the fields. And uh, now you see uh, the answer. Oh, 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 right, right, right. I forgot to write that one. Um, Okay, so you integrate in time and you get an L1 norm in time and an L n plus 2 norm in space. And uh, then uh, you, so now you see that you can control the high moments of F by the high L uh, P norms uh, of uh, K. And this is uh, what motivates which, uh, strict arts estimate you try to use. So you want uh, some high LR control of um, K. And you don't really care about the Q. You can sort of use it as a parameter. It's not such a big deal. Although you do want one there, but uh, you can, uh, since we're doing this for arbitrary large times and we're doing it for large data, you can sort of throw away a lot of powers of T and not really worry about it. Um, okay. So you, uh, you control it by your norm at the end? Yes, so, so now the game is to control this. Um, and you control it by a strict arts norm. Um, you just want it to be K. <coughs> yes, that's exactly right. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to make a big jump.
Okay, so uh, I'm going to make a big jump, um, but what can you do if uh, you try to explain this uh, craziness, then it takes another four lectures. Um, so you use uh, Strickhart's moment interpolation like this. So this is the tool you use, this kind of thing is a tool you use, and you use Strickhart's. You use the conservation laws, and you do a lot of optimization, and you choose a good epsilon. Um, that's a uh, inverse power of the nth moment of f, and uh, you, so you're basically bounding k up there using uh, the pointwise bound for k that I wrote down, and then you're using a strict hearts, and then you're uh, doing uh, a lot of holder inequality and a lot of optimization and moment interpolation and the conservation laws and choosing a good epsilon. And at the end of the day, you get uh, for, for n greater than 13. Um, Okay, this is what you get. Um, so the nth norm of f in uh, L infinity by the moment bounds, uh, when you do all this stuff to the right-hand side k term, uh, you get that uh, it's bounded by data times f uh, p0 to the n, L infinity L1 to the power alpha times f p0 to the n, uh, L infinity t L1x to the power alpha prime and f p0 n uh, l q prime l1 x to the power p. So here uh, q prime is uh, in one infinity and it's strictly less than infinity and that's uh, important. Um, so what we want to do is prove that um, f is bounded, prove that the high moment of f is bounded. Um, so, okay, yeah, let me briefly switch to slides and then uh, we can come back here. Okay, uh, I start with slides once, one uh, slide early. Okay, so, um, oh, actually, so what can you do? You can, uh, it turns out that alpha prime is bigger than alpha, at least you can assume that for n uh, larger than 13, say. And you can also suppose without loss of generality that the p0 to the nth moment of f in L infinity is bigger than one because if it's smaller than one, then you're done. Then the whole problem is solved. And then uh, you can divide through by f p0 to the n alpha prime in this kind of an inequality and you obtain uh, this kind of an inequality. 
Um, so f p0 to the n l infinity l1 is bounded above by a constant times 1 plus f p0 to the n 1 minus alpha prime lq uh, l1. And this, uh, so this automatically gives you uh, that f p0 to the n is bounded for large data. If you can get a sublinear bound, it's important that this 1 minus alpha prime is less than 1 then it's a homework problem to uh, prove that uh, f p0 to the n is bounded. Uh, furthermore, I claim that we got uh, good bounds, uh, only uh, one exponentially growing bounds uh, in the uh, theorem. So let me sort of tell you quickly how to do that. Um, so if uh, you have this uh, ground wall type inequality, it can be proved via a continuity argument. So let g0 be positive and a non-decreasing function and suppose, sorry, gt, and then gt satisfies uh, the inequality is less than or equal to m of t, 1 plus g in lp um, in time for some p finite. Then uh, there is a, and for some non-decreasing positive function m of t, then g of t is less than or equal to 2 m of t times e to the t m of t to the power p. Uh, you can prove this uh, by a simple continuity argument where you assume the bound is true and you use the inequality to actually get a better bound and that automatically implies that the bound is true. Okay, so from this lemma and from the previous uh, inequality we know that um, f, uh, the nth moment of uh, any nth moment of f for n uh, greater or equal to uh, uh, 13 is bounded, um, we, assuming that's true initially. Um, and then uh, you go back to uh, the moment bounds that you had before. Uh, so you go back to the original bound uh, for k, this one um, that I wrote down on the board. And uh, you can, once you know that the high moments of f are bounded, you can uh, use the same, this is kind of like this almost circular argument, you use this estimate to prove that the high moments of f are bounded, and then you come back to this estimate and you use that the high moments are bounded to prove that k is in fact in L infinity. Um, well, let me not sort of explain in detail how you do that, but you choose a good uh, L, uh, oh. You choose a good uh, LP, LQ norm, like L1 in time, L2 minus epsilon in space, and you, you, you uh, use the Strickhardt's estimates, and then you get that uh, the L infinity norm of K is bounded. Um, so in 2D and in 2 and a half D, you can actually prove that the L infinity norm of K is bounded. You can't prove it in, we don't know how to prove it in 3D. So this is, uh, this is 2D. Um, so now we have a continuation in criterion 3D involving the boundedness of norms. So uh, this is what I want to, this is the quantity that we want to study, m theta q, where m theta q is uh, p0 to the theta f l infinity time lq in space l1 in uh, momentum, and we want this to be finite, and we would like to say that if m theta q is bounded, then the solution can be continued beyond t for a certain theta q. Um, so you can, if you're familiar with Navier-Stokes, you can compare this to a continuation criteria for Navier-Stokes. Um, they have the so-called uh, uh, prady ladihanskaya serin conditions uh, that are motivated by scaling, where if the uh, Navier-Stokes equation is bounded in LPLQ, then um, your uh, solution is finite. There's a long history of studying that, and there's a scaling for Navier Stokes that predicts what uh, the reasonable ranges of uh, this of the Navier Stokes quantity are. Uh, let me not go into that more than that, except to say that uh, for uh, uh, of Maxwell, I'm not aware of a, a reasonable heuristic that's really convincing in the same way that scaling is convincing for what 
is the uh, full range that you can ever hope to uh, realistically prove as continuation criteria for this. Um, because if you rescale of Lassa Maxwell, you get Lassa Poisson, and it's a different equation and it's known to be globally regular. Um, and so, but the known estimates for the conservation laws give, uh, as I've shown uh, before, that P0, F, and L infinity, uh, L1 is finite. And this for m theta q is theta q is 1, 1. And additionally, it is known that, uh, you, so you can, you also have the L infinity um, conservation law. And uh, then you can use uh, interpolation like what you have here and choose your S and M uh, carefully. And you get that the uh, L infinity in time L four thirds norm in the ball is uh, bounded by a constant and the constant is, doesn't depend on R. So you can take R to infinity and use the whole space. And this is QR equals zero four thirds. Uh, sorry, this is theta Q equals zero four thirds. And uh, that's what we know for uh, what is uh, known to be bounded. And you can interpolate between these two bounds and get a range of Q and theta. Uh, I won't really worry about that too much. Um, but we are generally still uh, very far away from these bounds. Um, so, uh, oh, the title of this slide is misleading. So uh, you want m theta q to be bounded, and the first estimate that uh, of this form is fr that I'm aware of is from Glassy Strauss, and they prove that uh, p zero f in L infinity uh, x with uh, theta equal one is is would be a continuation criteria. This has the physical significance of being the kinetic energy density and uh, so the title of the slide is accidentally misleading um, because this continuation criteria actually holds even when you don't have compact support. Um, you just need uh, the solution to point-wise decay polynomially. So this is an L infinity statement about the decay of F. Um, as p goes to infinity. Okay, so that's the first criteria. Now you have a whole uh, collection of criteria. Um, so the first one that I knew about is uh, due to Pallard, uh, who's uh, in Orsay, and uh, the, he said that if theta is bigger than 4 over q and q is between 6 and infinity, uh, then uh, you have a continuation criteria. Again, you can always interpolate with the uh, like this with the L infinity bound that's known to get an L1 bound um, and to get that the L1 bound implies. So this is what you can prove and then there's what you can say to compare with uh, the known thing easily. So uh, Pallard's, Pallard's uh, estimate is uh, uh, to compare to the known thing is q, q equal 1 and theta greater than 19. So uh, what you what you want is uh, q equal uh, one and theta equal to one, so you're 18 away there. And then uh, these uh, this group from uh, Victoria, Canada, in 2010 showed that the endpoint case is actually also correct. So theta equals zero, q equals uh, infinity, um, is actually correct. Um, and uh, so then uh, Pollard very recently, 2014. Uh, showed that um, on the other side uh, you can uh, find a very uh, interesting and nice cancellation in the, uh, the ST decomposition and uh, knock these uh, estimates down to theta equals 0 and Q equals 6. So again you have theta equals 0, Q equals 6 compared to theta equals 0, Q equals 4 thirds is known so you're still far away but it's much better than uh, say theta equals zero and uh, q equal infinity. Um, so, oh, okay, and then this is what, was, so all of those previous results are in the re range of a compact support. So uh, we finished this paper in 2014 and uh, with non-compact support, um, you can get theta greater than two over q and q between two and infinity and uh, by interpolation, uh, this would give you q, q equal 1 and theta equals 5. So this knocks you down uh, a lot. Um, and then uh, there was another paper uh, after that 
by Kunze from uh, who's in Germany, and he comes. Uh, he's uh, actually, as far as I know, he's written two papers on Vlasa of Maxwell. One was his thesis in the uh, in the eighties or the nineties, and then he wrote this paper in two thousand fifteen. Uh, and uh, he, but he comes from this uh, old uh, school of people uh, like um, Gerhard Rhein and uh, Fafel Moser and Horst and Bott. Uh, from uh, this chain of advisors and students out of Germany. And uh, he uh, proved that he actually beat us in the compact support case. So we were doing non-compact support, and he went back to he, he, he went back to compact support, and he said for Q between 1 and infinity, you have this theta. This, if you look at his paper, this isn't exactly what he stated, but he stated it in a weird way that's hard to compare to what we did, so I changed it. And for q equal 1, this requires theta greater than 3, so we knocked it down to 3. Um, so he had some new ideas that were very nice, and I'll tell you about later. Uh, but he also used some of our ideas, like the Strickhardt's estimates, and, uh, he, and he used compact support. So compact support really saves you um, an order of uh, one order of p, which makes the estimates uh, one order of p uh, better. Um, and his proof really, uh, you can't, we tried and you can't really modify his proof to uh, the non-compact support case directly. Um, and the, Neil Patel, who's a graduate student uh, working with me, is finishing soon, uh, very recently uh, was able to uh, get the currently best uh, continuation criteria in this direction. So with, without compact support, he can get q equals 1 and theta greater than 3. And so this uh, improves the q equal 1 theta greater than 5. And with compact support, he can get q equal 1 and theta greater than 2 plus 3 over 5. So it doesn't look um, that much bigger than uh, theta greater than 3, but it's uh, for me it's significant because it goes beyond what you can get from the street cards estimates, and I'm still optimistic that you can go further than this with the uh, technique. So we really thought that uh, uh, Kunze had gotten the best uh, continuation criteria that you can get using these methods with street cards estimates. Um, but it turns out if you go back to Strickard's original paper, uh, he used a sharp uh, averaging operator estimate for the sphere. Um, and if I remember, if I, I think the history is uh, that he claimed this estimate was true and he didn't actually prove it and later, uh, but it was correct. And later uh, other people wrote down the sharp proof of the sharp averaging operator estimate for the sphere. In any case, you can use that to uh, go beyond uh, what you get with Strickhardt's estimates. Uh, so this is uh, what you can do. Um, I was going to switch to his blackboard now. But, uh, how much time do I have? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do you want to know? Uh, well, normally you have 15 minutes. OK. <laughs> OK. Um, so. <laughs> Okay, so um, we have a lot on the board that can be reused. Um, uh, not that. Not that. This. Okay, so. Okay, so in 3D, uh, the estimate that you get uh, to bound the moments is uh, n plus 3, n plus 3. And uh, you have to assume the bound, uh, the integral from 0 to t ds k of s x of s is less than or equal to c of t. Um, 
And so uh, we start by um, assuming this bound, and we we want to uh, bound a. Uh, then we have we have this moment uh, type inequality, and we want to use a, figure out how to control k. So basically, the strategy is similar to the 2D strategy, except one, you want to assume uh, a bound on uh, m theta q. Uh, let's just do uh, m. Uh, what is Okay, I'm going to use this notation a lot. So um, m1 plus 2 means uh, a number bigger than 1. Um, so we want to uh, assume this is bounded and use it to show that this is bounded. And we want to do that via moment bounds. Um, so. Oh. So ideally, what you want is um, we want a good strict arts estimate. Uh, to bound k, um, but what is it? Um, Okay, so uh, this is the point-wise estimate that you can get in 3D. It's worse than what you get in 2D, and that's uh, part of the problem. And you want to uh, plug this into the moment bound up there, and you want to use a good uh, strict arts estimate. Um, but the ideal strict arts estimate is problematic. Um, Okay, this is the ideal uh, estimate that we want to use. Um, unfortunately, it's false. <laughs> there, are, there are known counterexamples. You can't do this. Um, but you can, uh, you can do this. Okay, I'm going to use the notation L2 plus, L infinity minus uh, L2 plus, so plus means you're bigger than the number there, and a minus means you're smaller than the number there. Infinity minus means you're finite and smaller than infinity. Um, so the ideal strict arts estimate is false in 3D. Uh, so, but, so that makes your life much more complicated. Um, and um, Mm -hmm. 
let me give you a flavor of how to estimate um, one term. So, but so you instead of using the ideal Strickart estimate, you use a uh, almost as good Strickart estimate, and then. Uh, You get you have to estimate everything. Okay, so then uh, K, So I should say, uh, yeah, this is, I said it, okay. Okay, so this is what you get. Um, and this is, um, so you need to, uh, so eventually, uh, since you'll probably ask, uh, we want to, uh, we have this bound one, and we have uh, the moment bound, and so we want to bound k from above by something, then we want to bound the moments, and then we want to use the moments to bound uh, the k, um, and then we want to do all that conditional on uh, the m1 plus 2 quantity being bounded, and then we want to use all of that together to show that the integral of k along the characteristics is finite. Um, so, so let's go. Um, so let's bound the first term. So uh, by a holder, let me just call this one. Okay, uh, so what did I do? I almost took a K in L infinity, and uh, to pay the price for that, I uh, made this 2 a little bit larger. Um, one. Yes. Mm, okay, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, that's probably a typo. But uh, I'll, I'll just put infinity here. Um, we ignore the. Um, so in a lot of these types of arguments, you don't really have to pay so close attention to the exponent time. Of course, you want to be correct, but you can. Uh, at the end of the day, what you want is. Um, um, oh wait. Mm, I don't want to put infinity there though. I want to put it here. Um, 
Okay. Uh, yeah. So then. Um, So here, here what, yes. what, what, what exactly are you trying to prove? Like, what's the, the continuation, right? Assuming what, I mean, can you recall? Okay, yeah, so I have this uh, moment bound up there. P, P to the nf is less than 1 plus k to the ln plus 3. Um, then I have this bound for k here, uh, point-wise bound. And then I use uh, the strict arts estimate that I wrote there in K, so in the bound for K, and then I um, get this, and then I'm going to estimate these terms from above in terms of the conservation laws and the uh, moment bound and um, other things. I'm going to do interpolation and stuff like that. And then um, you use that to prove that the high moments are bounded. And then you prove that uh, K is bounded. And then uh, you have that the M plus 2 implies that this continuation criteria is true. And this continuation criteria in terms of the integral along a K is uh, bounded. And we proved that last time. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, the, but the continuation criteria is what? What is the assumption? So here in 3D? That's, in, that's the assumption. The, the assumption which is the one above, right? The yeah, the, the integral from 0 to TDS of k of s along the characteristics is bounded, is finite. This is the assumption. That, so that if you assume that, you can continue the solution. And now we're saying if you assume that, it implies, the, the, the assumption on M implies the assumption on the integral of K along the characteristics. So that implies that M is a continuation criteria. Okay, um, yeah. So, uh, can I say yes. so, so, so basically this condition of the characteristic, so of course like in the case of compact support, yes. it's true, I mean like having compact support and that keeps Compact support. Yes. Right, so this is somehow a way of generalizing that. Yes, this is a this is a generalization of the compact support assumption that it is continues to be true in the non-compactly supported case. Absolutely. Okay. Um, because of time constraints, um, I would like to uh, switch back to slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have this bound for K and um, then you plug in the uh, uh, the strict arts estimate that I mentioned, and then you get uh, two terms that you need to estimate. One of them uh, you can estimate uh, using Holder and the uh, conservation law. So you get that th this first term is bounded because it's in L2, so you can uh, get this exactly in L2 with an exponent that's less than 1, and then you can get this which is with something that's finite but large with an exponent that's close to zero and then you can get uh, this leftover part by uh, holder basically um, oh. and then um, using and then this leftover part that I mentioned to you uh, just a second ago can be bounded using the uh, interpolation inequality by oh we are in the wrong place <laughs> the same stuff uh, okay um sorry so uh yeah 
similar story, but uh, that was the Q equals infinity case. Uh, so uh, similar story, we need to bound these two terms and uh, using, and you do it using Holder's inequality. So first you, and you get K is L1 L infinity, and this is, uh, that should be an L infinity there, L2 something that's bigger than something that's bigger than two. And then for K uh, L1 L infinity, you bound it by the L2 conservation law and something uh, that's like L infinity a little less. And then, um, since uh, f is in uh, L infinity, uh, you can uh, inc also increase this a little bit to get that a P0F dp L1, L2. It, you increase the power a little bit and you reduce the L2 a little bit and you have a L infinity that's of f that's hiding in the constant. And then you can bound this by m theta 2, which is the uh, quantity that we're assuming is finite and you get this less than 1. So collecting all of this, you get that this term, which was the first term we wanted to estimate, is bounded above by a constant times an, an exponent that's less than 1, 2 plus L infinity minus. This 2 plus we don't really care about. The L infinity minus is uh, important, and the sublinear bound uh, 1 minus is important. Um, so then you can bring the k to the other side. Um, Okay, let me be quick here. So then uh, for the other term, uh, you can do a bunch of interpolation and bound it by m theta 2 to some power that you don't care about times the p0 to the power n to the power alpha, m plus 3 l1 l1. Um, and basically you do that by using a holder and uh, this interpolation again. So we're using this interpolation a lot. Um, and then um, what you get is this inequality 10 here. So you get k L2 plus L n plus 3 is less than or equal to p0 to the nf to the power alpha over n plus 3 L1 L1. So here we choose in all the previous things we choose infinity minus to be n plus 3 where n plus 3 is a high moment. And then uh, the important thing here is that this alpha is strictly less than 1. So then uh, this we plug in the standard moment bounds that I stated before. P0 to the nf L1 L1 is bounded by k ln plus 3. And then you plug in, uh, so you have the L1 here, but you can trivially go up to L2 plus paying with it by some power of capital T that you don't care about. And then you get that p0 to the n in L1 is bounded by p0 to the n in L1 times a power which is smaller than 1. And that is a sublinear bound, so it tells you that p0 to the n is uh, less than 1. And it tells you to that k L2 plus Ln plus 3 is also less than 1, uh, less than a big constant, which you can approximate to be 1. Uh, this is unfortunately this not good enough for k. So our goal is to show that uh, m theta 2 finite implies k, uh, the integral of k along the characteristics is finite. And in the uh, 2D and 2 and a half D case, you can just directly prove that k is in uh, L infinity. In the 3D case, uh, which implies the continuation criteria in 3D, we don't know that. Uh, we don't know how to prove that. Um, but what you can do is use a, a change of variable uh, due to uh, Pollard. Uh, so Pollard didn't prove this estimate, but he, he proved it related estimates uh, that, uh, and he did a change of variable, which is what, basically what we use. Um, that, so actually in 3D, you really have to use, prove that the integral of k along the characteristics is bounded. Uh, you can't just prove that it's uh, k is bounded without caring about the characteristics. This is really a statement along the characteristics. So you say that the integral of k along the characteristics is bounded by the L4 norm in x and the L1 norm in p of k f to the p0. And uh, then you also have another term f to the p0 in L4, L1. 
Um, and then uh, because you have high moment bounds for F, you can uh, prove that the quantities above are bounded by uh, basic uh, holder and things like that. Um, okay, so I tell you um, Pallard's uh, inequality. So you, you uh, have integrals like this, and then you end up with this map pi, which is the characteristics time s prime minus sw, uh, omega, where omega is on the sphere, and this is a, uh, this turns out to be a C1 diffeomorphism, and it has a nice Jacobian that you can calculate. The Jacobian is singular, but under uh, certain conditions on the powers of P, its integral is finite, and uh, so that's why you do. You just have integrals like this, and you uh, use uh, uh, this Jacobian. Uh, so the, the, what's really going on here is that we're converting in 3D the integral on uh, the boundary of the cone to the integral on a solid region. So then you can uh, uh, really use the LP norms in the whole uh, space. Um, and otherwise, uh, it's hard to do that. Um, and this is the only thing you can do. And in 2D, you can do this uh, almost arbitrarily because the wave, it, the inverse of the box is uh, almost arbitrary. And then, I'm, and then uh, in 3D, you have to be more careful and you get restrictions on the uh, LP norms that come up, that come out of when this uh, Jacobian integral will be finite when you do something like a holder. Okay, um, so the last thing I want to tell you about is uh, Neil Patel's improvement. This will be quick. So uh, Kunze introduced this quantity. So he changed uh, the kind of things that you study and he said, well, you can study sigma minus one and you can just isolate this and prove estimates for this quantity and uh, streamline everything. And then uh, Patel further also used a similar quantity where you have a power one half here instead of one, he calls it capital sigma minus one. And then you can, uh, with some work, streamline the field estimates and you get, uh, you split them into KS1, KS2, and KT where KT is less than uh, W2 sigma minus 1, KS2 using the good conservation law is less than W2 sigma squared minus 1 to the 1 half, and KS1 is less than box inverse absolute value of K, capital phi minus 1. Um, and W2 is uh, this integral of the average on the sphere. Um, so, and this is, uh, this is an averaging operator, um, and this so you, and then uh, you have this uh, Strickhart's estimate, sharp estimate, known to be sharp estimate for the averaging operator on the sphere. And you can generalize that to uh, an estimate for the W2 operator directly. And this streamlines a lot of stuff and it holds for a range of exponents that I won't uh, punish you by explaining. And then uh, there's, a, uh, there's a new argument to prove that uh, if the three plus epsilonth moment is bounded, then the five plus epsilonth moment is bounded. And from uh, my favorite was Jonathan Luke, uh, the five plus moment is, is bounded is a continuation criteria. Therefore, the three plus moment, three plus epsilon moment being bounded is also a continuation criteria. And that's how you uh, reduce. Um, okay, so thank you very much. Um, and. Uh, Do you expect global distance for general data or some kind of singularity? Oh, so um, that's a very good question. And um, I like to answer that question by saying, uh, I don't know. I mean, any uh, saying that anything that I, I will give you an answer, but let me give you a, a slightly longer answer. Um, the uh, 
in general, you don't know, and uh, anything, any uh, comment that I make is just uh, speculation. Uh, that having been said, uh, for this equation, when gamma equals plus one, at least uh, there's uh, no physical argument that I'm aware of to uh, produce singularities, and uh, you don't. If you look in the physics, no one uh, gives an argument to produce singularities. There's a, a lot of things like stability, instability. There's a a huge, I didn't talk at all, but there's a huge number of steady states um, that you can uh, talk about. And uh, the, the big problem is that the, uh, when you do things this way, the, uh, the estimates that you can prove with the techniques that we have so far at least, and that we've been able to figure out, uh, give you a grand wall that doesn't sh say that anything is bounded. Um, so uh, that doesn't help. But uh, get you, you have to reduce the powers somehow. Uh, if you want me to speculate, yeah, I think this is globally regular. Um, but for the gamma equals plus one place in uh, 3D, yeah, I think that uh, there's a, it's probably going to be regular. Okay. For minus, it could be similar. For minus, uh, it's not as uh, obvious. I mean, so uh, for uh, the lasso Poisson case, uh, either plus or minus, you have uh, global regularity, except in the relativistic case, which cannot be derived from this model, then when in the minus one case, uh, you have uh, singularities, and I mentioned the papers that study that on Monday. Um. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, other questions? Um, uh, this yes. is more of kind of a global question. Yes. Um, so you said that these um, Maxwell Vlasov equations describe plasmas, yes. like heavily charged particles. So, um, is there some kind of a connection with the Landau equation, which also describes? Um, yes. Oh, that's that's a very good question. Um, so, is there a connection between Vlasov Maxwell and uh, the Landau? equation from plasma physics. I've actually studied the Landau equation quite a bit um, in my life and uh, it is a uh, very hard uh, diffu non-local diffusion equation where the uh, diffusion coefficient is non-local and singular um, and uh, that is uh, one of the few examples in the uh, spatially homogeneous Boltzmann equation theory where you still don't know global regularity for large data and it's a really important open problem, in my opinion. Um, okay, so uh, actually, if you go to Landau Lifshitz, um, there is a very, very non rigorous um, derivation of the Landau equation from uh, Lasov Poisson that uses, uh, you just uses uh, all sorts of. Uh, uh, approximations that aren't justified and in addition uses uh, contour uh, integral techniques that are only valid for analytic functions um, even though he, you're working with arbitrary unknown functions that you don't necessarily understand uh, and, but and and also uh, in the the derivation of the Landau equation is a little bit um, hard to um, justify because uh, it involves a logarithmic infinity that uh, Landau said, oh, it's a logarithm, who cares? Um, but uh, the, the uh, physical constant in front of the uh, diffusion coefficient in the Landau equation is actually uh, a log that goes to infinity um, that you just cut off. Um, and there are also um, difficulties in uh, the assumptions that you use physically to you make a, you make an assumption on the particle on the two particle interactions when you even heuristically derive the Landau equation from an underlying uh, model of dynamics of uh, many particle dynamics uh, that uh, you also have to think about carefully so um, given all the caveats yes there are uh, connections between these two equations. Um, another connection is that uh, you can, as I have done and other people have done, you can study uh, Vlasov-Poisson-Landau and La Vlasov-Maxwell-Landau, which is uh, 
the Vlasov equation, instead of zero on the right-hand side, you have the Landau uh, collision operator on the right-hand side. The Landau collision operator is thought to be a higher order effect than the uh, transport effects from the uh, Vlasov systems. So we are we have a uh